I want your soul. Do you need help with that? The Uber driver asked when he saw me struggling to pull my duffel bag out of his car. Nope, I grunted. I got it. Thanks, though. The duffel bag belonged to my father. He was going to be pissed once he realized I'd taken it. Probably even more pissed when he realized I had no intention of returning home with it. Ever since my mother passed away, my father expected me to do all of the things she used to do, like cook dinner and do the laundry, and still keep up with my college courses. I'd finally gotten fed up with this crap and packed up everything I owned and left. I'd planned my escape months ago and was just waiting until I'd finished my finals for the semester before leaving. As luck would have it, I even found the perfect place to stay that morning. I took that as a sign that I was doing the right thing. This place looks amazing. I looked up at the old Victorian home I'd been dropped off at in front of as the Uber driver drove away. It was absolutely beautiful, but desperately in need of a new paint job. The paint was starting to peel or had completely weathered away in several places, showing the wood beneath. Folded up in the back pocket of my jeans was the classified section from the newspaper. Inside it, I'd found an ad for a room for rent at a price I could actually afford. The ad had just come out that morning, so I was counting on it still being available. Normally, I would have called and asked about the room before traveling all the way across town, but I couldn't. There was no phone number listed in the ad, just an address. The house wasn't exactly in the best part of town, but I didn't really have many options, not with the job I had lined up. If the room didn't pan out, I would fall back to my original plan of staying with my friend Heidi for a few weeks until I could find something else. As I stood on the sidewalk, my phone chimed. I dropped the duffel bag onto the ground and looked at it, seeing that I'd receive a text from Heidi asking if I'd gotten to the room. I'm about to find out about it right now, I said out loud as I typed the same thing into the text box and hit send. A moment later, I snapped a picture of the front of the house and sent that to her as well. I received another text from her that said, I think I saw that house in a horror movie, lol. This was quickly followed by another one that said, I love it. We totally have to have a Halloween party there. I replied by sending two ghost emojis with a party popper emoji between them. There won't be any parties if I don't get that room though, I thought, slinging the duffel bag over my shoulder and making my way up the walk to the front door. The steps creaked in protest as I walked onto the porch and pushed the button for the doorbell. While I waited for the owner to answer, I glanced over at the two rocking chairs sitting to the side of the door, facing the street. Both of them were covered in cobwebs and dead leaves. If I got the room, I intended to clean those chairs so I could sit outside and read a book or just watch the cars drive by. It would be nice to finally have some time to do things I enjoyed, instead of having to spend what little free time I had taking care of my dad. Well, maybe the doorbell doesn't work, I thought. I didn't recall hearing it when I pressed the button, so I raised my fist and knocked on the door as loudly as I could. There was no way I was going to leave without talking to the owner first. If they weren't home, I was going to wipe off one of those rockers and sit there until they opened. Thankfully, I didn't have to do that. Shortly after I knocked, I heard footsteps and then the sound of a rusty hinge being pried open. Instead of there being a peephole in the door, there was a little metal hatch that could be used to look outside. The sound of that being opened is what I heard. What do you want? The woman behind the door asked, her voice dry and raspy. Hi. I gave a quick wave as I replied. My name's Macy. I lifted the classified ad so she could see it. I'm here about the room for rent. I tried to sound upbeat and chipper while I answered her. A room for rent? She sounded confused. This is 55 Sycamore Way, right? I asked, reciting the address that was listed in the ad, wondering if I had walked up to the wrong house. She turned away from the door, looking behind her at something in the house. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is 55 Sycamore, she confirmed, returning her attention to me. The room. She smiled, seemingly coming to her senses. Yeah, I, I do have a room for rent. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a little scatterbrained this morning. She twirled her finger right next to her head. My mom was the same way the last few months before she died. That made me feel a little sorry for the woman, especially if she lived in that big old house all by herself. Why don't you come on inside, Macy? She unlocked the door and swung it open. And I'll give you the tour. I'm Charlotte. She extended her hand and forced a smile to her lips. It's nice to meet you. 
I took her hand and returned the smile. Likewise, I said. Before Charlotte shut the door, she poked her head outside and stood like that for a moment, looking up and down the street. As she did that, the ceiling in the foyer creaked, as though something heavy had just shifted on the floor above us. Charlotte jumped slightly and pulled herself back into the house, quickly shutting and locking the door behind her. When she saw me glance up at the ceiling, she said, It's an old house. If you stay here, you're going to have to get used to all the odd noises it makes. Oh, it's okay. I've always dreamed of living in a house like this, I replied, amazed at how beautiful the interior of the house was compared to the outside. I think I can handle it. Well, we shall see, she quipped before leading me into the nearest room. Charlotte seemed a little rough around the edges, but I sort of expected that from an older woman like her. In a way, she reminded me of my grandmother, which allowed me to brush aside her abrasive demeanor. This is the living room. She spread her hands. You can leave that in here if you like. She pointed at the duffel bag that was still slung over my shoulder. I set the bag on the floor and walked around the room, reaching my hand out to run my fingers along the velvet fabric of the antique couch. I felt like I had stepped back in time. Everything in the room looked vintage. I didn't see a modern item anywhere. Even the books on the bookcase looked old. Over there is the dining room, Charlotte pointed to the archway across the foyer. I don't use it very often, for obvious reasons. A large oval table with a dozen chairs dominated the room. Do you live here alone? I asked. I assumed that was the case after her last comment. I do. Her reply was curt as she brushed past me and returned to the foyer. The kitchen is this way, she said. Oh my god, this is huge. The kitchen was as big as the living room and similarly furnished with antiques, including a bunch of cast iron pots and pans, hanging from a rack above an island in the center of the room. This is where I usually eat. She was standing next to a small breakfast table in the corner of the room that was bordered on two sides by several large windows, giving a nice view of the garden in the backyard. You, of course, are free to eat wherever you want. Charlotte was talking like the room was already mine. I smiled. I'd probably just want to eat in here too, I said, and I turned my head towards the windows. The view outside is amazing. Well, I used to think so too, she sighed, letting her gaze linger on the backyard view for a moment. Speaking of eating, she said suddenly, returning to the previous subject, the pantry is always fully stocked. She walked over to a narrow door and opened it, revealing a room filled from floor to ceiling with all kinds of food. Wow, you could feed an army with all of that, I gasped. Well, I don't leave the house. She closed the door and crossed the kitchen again. Groceries are delivered once a month. If there's something special you want to add to the list, just write it here. She gestured at a small chalkboard that was hanging on the wall. I can buy my own groceries, I said. Oh, nonsense, she waved away the thought. As you said, there's enough food in there to feed an army. You're welcome to help yourself to any of it. The refrigerator's just as full, she nodded at the old appliance. Uh, okay, thanks, I appreciate it. Through there is the laundry room, Charlotte continued the tour, pointing at a door on the other side of the kitchen, opposite the breakfast table. And through there, she moved her hand so that her finger was pointing at another door, is the cellar. She then fixed her eyes on mine. You don't want to go down there. Okay, well, I try not to make a habit of hanging out in cellars, I joked. Well, I certainly hope so. She sounded serious now. Let's go upstairs, she suddenly declared, turning and walking out of the kitchen. I followed Charlotte up the stairs and onto the second floor landing where she had stopped to wait for me. There are four bedrooms up here. You can have whichever one you like. Okay, well, which one is yours? I'm currently staying in the one at the end of the hall. She gestured in that direction. It's a big house. I moved from room to room for a change of scenery. I thought that was a bit weird at first, but the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. If she lived there by herself, why wouldn't she make use of all the rooms? I'd probably do the same thing if I had that many rooms to choose from. Walk around, see which ones you like best, Charlotte said as she descended the steps. Then come and find me downstairs when you're done. I walked into the first room and thought that this must be the master bedroom. It, like every other room in the house, was fully furnished with antique furniture, which included a solid wood four-post king bed with a canopy along with matching nightstands, dresser, and wardrobe. When I walked into the attached bathroom, it was larger than my bedroom at my dad's house. I wasn't surprised to see that it didn't have a shower, just a large clawfoot tub. I knew enough about old homes to know the showers weren't particularly popular at the time they were being built. That was a little disappointing to me. I did prefer showers to baths, but not enough to allow it to dissuade me from wanting to stay here. 
The rest of the bedrooms were similar, but everything about them was smaller. The bathroom in the hall was also similar to the master bathroom, just a bit more cramped feeling. I didn't go into the bedroom that the homeowner said she was staying in. To do so would have felt like an invasion of her privacy, so I decided not to. Did you find one you liked? Charlotte asked. After returning to the first floor, I'd found her in the laundry room, pulling clothes out of the ancient looking dryer and putting them into a basket. I did. I really liked the one across from the stairs. As much as I would have liked to take the master bedroom, I thought that would have been inappropriate. Well, then it's yours, she said. If you like, you can grab some fresh sheets out of the linen closet and put them on the bed once she gets settled. It's been a while since I've used that room. I think it's locked, I said, recalling the only door I hadn't been able to open was when I was walking around upstairs. Well, that wasn't the linen closet, Charlotte replied. The only locked door you'll find up there is the one that leads to the attic. The linen closet is behind you. She nodded towards the door I was standing in front of. Is the attic off limits too? I asked, assuming she didn't want me up there if she kept it locked. Well, not exactly. You're welcome to go up there once you find the key, but I doubt you'll find it all that interesting. It's just filled with a bunch of old junk. You'll see. She picked up her basket of clean clothes and started to leave the laundry room. Why don't you take your bag up to your room and get settled? She suggested on her way out. About the room, I said thinking this was the perfect time to talk about the specifics of renting it. What is it that you need from me? Do I have to pay a deposit or something? She stopped in the doorway, looking back. Let me put this stuff away, and then we can talk, she said, indicating the basket of clothes she was holding. In the meantime, why don't you make yourself at home? Okay, I replied. I would have preferred to know the specifics before settling in, but I guess that wasn't going to be the case. She gave me another one of her thin-lipped smiles and then walked away. Unable to decide what to do with myself, I took Charlotte's advice and took my bag up to the room I'd chosen. When I made it to the second floor landing, I noticed that her bedroom door was closed. I didn't find that odd. What put me off was how easily she'd accepted me into her home without knowing anything about me. I could be robbing her blind right now and she'd never even know it. Maybe she's not right in the head. The thought jumped into my mind, bringing with it the comment Charlotte had made when she first answered the door about being scatterbrained. Well, maybe she's going senile. I guess it doesn't matter, and I pushed the thoughts away. I needed the room. I didn't really want to have to live with Heidi and her boyfriend. Thinking of Heidi made me want to tell her the good news. After dropping the duffel bag onto the bed, I pulled out my phone to text her. But no service. I looked at the top of my phone and saw the notification. No service. Well, that's not cool. I guess I'll have to text her later. I put my phone on the dresser and decided to go ahead and unpack my stuff. I didn't bring much with me, meaning if I needed to leave, it wouldn't be too much of a bother to shove it all back into the duffel bag and just go. When I was done, I laid on the bed and stared at the ceiling until I dozed off. Going to bed late and then getting up early to escape from my dad had finally caught up with me. I wasn't asleep for long before a loud noise woke me up. It sounded like someone lugging something down the stairs. I dragged myself out of the bed and over to the railing that surrounded the stairs so I could see what was going on. It took my sleep-addled brain a moment to comprehend what I was seeing. Standing before the open front door was Charlotte. Next to her was a large suitcase which she picked up before stepping out onto the porch. Where are you going? I was halfway down the steps when I asked. Charlotte turned. The look on her face told me she was surprised to see me. I'm going home. The words came out as a sob. Now that I was closer to her, I could see that she was crying. I don't understand what you mean. Oh, you will. It sounded like a warning. Before I could join her on the porch and get her to explain herself, the front door slammed shut on its own. I rushed over and tried to open it, but it was stuck and wouldn't budge. I checked it several times to see if it was locked, but it wasn't. Why won't you open? I grunted as I placed my foot against the wall for leverage and tried to pull the door open several times. All I succeeded in doing was wearing my energy out. Exhausted, I slunk to the floor with my back against the door. And that's when I heard the rest of the doors throughout the house slamming shut one after the other. Hello, I called out as I got to my feet, thinking there was someone else in the house with me. Is somebody there? Unsurprisingly, there was no reply. Ah, oh, fuck this, I said, rushing over to the nearest window in the living room, intending to get out of the house by any means possible. I threw the curtains open, making sure the window was unlatched, and then tried to pull it open, but I couldn't. Like the door, it wouldn't budge either. This is ridiculous, I said out loud. I tried the other window in the living room, but it couldn't open either. I need to get the fuck out of this house one way or another. 
Sitting on one of the end tables was a large glass ashtray. I grabbed it and returned to the window. Sorry, not sorry, I said, pulling my arm back and throwing the ashtray at the glass. Instead of crashing through the window like I thought it would, the ashtray bounced off the pane of glass then fell to the floor. Panic thoughts ran through my mind and I realized that I was trapped. The thought jumped into my head, but I refused to believe it. No longer caring if someone was in the house with me, I ran around the first floor, searching for a way out. The first place I tried was the kitchen, where I'd seen a door that led outside to the backyard. No luck there. I threw pots and pans at the windows surrounding the breakfast table, but they just bounced off the glass like the ashtray had. After trying everything I could think of to escape the house from the first floor, I went up to the second floor, bringing a cast iron skillet along with me. When I made it to the top of the stairs, I noticed that all of the doors up there were closed, all of them except for the one leading into Charlotte's bedroom. I raised the skillet over my head, ready to swing it if someone were to jump out at me as I slowly made my way over to the room I had chosen. If I could get inside, I'd be able to grab my phone from where I'd left it on the dresser and maybe call for help. As far as I could tell, the house didn't have any landlines. Not that I could find one anyways. That meant my phone was likely the only one in the house. Of course, I sighed when I couldn't get the doorknob to turn. Feeling like I had no other option, I walked down the hall to Charlotte's room and stood in the doorway. The only sign that she had been there was a cardboard box in the center of the bed. I walked into the room, set the skillet on the mattress, then pulled open the flaps of the box. Inside it was a note. Beneath the note was a bunch of personal items that Charlotte had left behind which amounted to a few articles of clothing, some cosmetics, and various other toiletries. I picked up the note and it read, Keep what you want and put the rest in the attic. That's all that was on it. Put it in the attic yourself, I muttered as I started to walk out of the room, leaving the box on the bed. I didn't make it two steps before the bedroom door slammed shut in front of me, locking me inside. That was the second time in the past half hour I'd seen a door close by itself. I think this place might be haunted. If you had asked me if I believed in ghosts before I stepped foot in this house, I would have replied with an emphatic no. Standing there alone in Charlotte's room, I was starting to rethink my views on the subject. Please let me out, I begged, hoping that whatever was listening would take pity on me and open the door. I knew it would be pointless to try and force my way out, so I didn't bother trying. When it was clear that begging wasn't going to work, I sat on the bed, picking up the box and setting it on my lap so I could go through it, wanting to see what Charlotte had left behind. There was a slim chance something inside of it might help me get out of the room, but I looked anyways. As soon as I lifted the box off the bed, the door then swung open. When I set the box back down, it closed again. Oh, I guess I'm taking the box with me. Carrying the box with two hands, I was able to leave the room without incident. However, once I was in the hall, the bedroom door slammed shut behind me while another door swung open. That must lead to the attic. Behind the door that had opened was a narrow set of stairs. Take what you want, put the rest in the attic. That is what Charlotte's note had said. Looks like I wasn't being given a choice in the matter. I walked up the stairs and into the attic, not surprised to find it full of a bunch of old junk, just like Charlotte had said. What did surprise me was what I found when I got a little nosy and started going through a few of the boxes that were up there. As far as I could tell, each box contained items that belonged to a different woman. And judging from the number of boxes, it was safe to assume that a lot of women had stayed in that house. One of the things I found curious about the attic was how the further I went into it, the older the contents of the boxes seemed to be. The last box I looked in had a newspaper from the 60s in it. Why are you showing me this unless... The more I thought about it, the more things began to make sense, once I was able to put them into perspective. This is my orientation. That had to be it. It all makes sense now. I'm Charlotte's replacement. That's why she was acting so weird and why she tried to sneak out of here. She knew I was here to take her place and didn't want to say or do anything to keep that from happening. That bitch. I'd set Charlotte's box on the floor when I'd reached the attic. On my way back to the stairs, I kicked it, knocking it over and spilling some of the contents. One of the items that fell out was a college ID card. I picked it up and examined it. The name on the card was Charlotte Morris. The picture showed a young blonde girl about my age, who looked like she could be related to the Charlotte who had left me trapped inside this house. I knew it couldn't be her, though, because the ID had last year's date on it, probably her daughter's. I tossed the ID back onto the floor with the rest of the stuff that had fallen out and then left the attic. When I left the attic and walked back down to the second floor, 
I noticed that all the doors were still closed. I tried to open a couple of them, but I couldn't. The house was keeping me locked out for some reason. What do you want from me? I yelled, throwing my hands out and turning in a circle to address whoever or whatever was listening to me. In response came the rattling of pots and pans from the kitchen. I guess you want me to go down to the kitchen. All right, I'm here, I said once I'd made it down the stairs and over to the archway leading into the kitchen. It didn't take me long to figure out what I was supposed to do. The cellar door was wide open. Just get it over with, I thought. I took a deep breath, sighed, and approached the doorway. The closer I got, the less I wanted to go down into the cellar. Whatever was down there smelled like mildew, dust, and wet leather. It wasn't a pleasant smell. The sooner I go down there, the sooner I can come back up, I thought. Hopefully. The narrow staircase creaked as I began to descend the steps. When I was about halfway down, the cellar door gently swung closed. At least it didn't slam it this time. I wasn't able to see anything until I made it to the bottom of the stairs. As soon as I saw what was down there, I said, Nope and ran right back up the stairs, pounding on the door to be let out. I got the point. I get the point, and I don't need to see anything else. I said out loud, but the door didn't open. After about 15 minutes of pleading, I gave up and went back down into the cellar. This is close enough, I said, sitting on the bottom step and forcing myself to look over at the mummified bodies that were lined up along the far wall. There were 12 of them. All of them were women. Some people get to leave, I said, thinking about Charlotte's hasty exit from the house, and some don't. Is that the point you want to make? The door remained closed. As I looked closer at their bodies, I noticed that there appeared to be writing on the wall behind them, but I couldn't make out any of what it said from where I was. Maybe that's what it wants me to see. I got to my feet and slowly approached the line of bodies squatting in front of them when I was close enough to read the writing. I will obey, someone had written several times. I'm sorry, another had written. There were several more comments like that before I found one that made me stop and think. It said, The house provides when you abide. Near that, someone had written, The house always gets what it wants. Don't fight, I said, returning to the bottom of the stairwell and staring up at the door. That's why you made me come down here. You wanted me to see what would happen if I didn't cooperate. And then the door swung open. As soon as I returned to the kitchen, the first thing I did was find something to drink. And I'm not talking about a glass of water. The kitchen was fully stocked with everything I needed, which thankfully included a few bottles of vodka, the expensive kind. I grabbed a glass out of the cupboard and took the bottle over to the breakfast table, where I sat down and poured myself a shot. When I finished that one, I poured a second. I sat at the table looking out of the backyard until the alcohol began to dull my senses. I may have been underage, but I was no lightweight. I spent a great deal of time going to parties after my mother died, trying to numb myself to the world. While I sat there mulling over my fate, the house opened all of the interior doors except for the ones leading into the attic and the cellar. Those two doors remained locked to me. The first thing I did when I realized I could roam around again was go upstairs and retrieve my phone. The next thing I did was move all of my stuff into the master bedroom. If I was going to be stuck here, I was going to be comfortable. I spent the rest of that first day looking for an escape route and some place where my phone had service without trying to be obvious that that's what I was doing. I struck out on both counts. The next week, I crawled by as I learned the rules of the house, which were very simple. They are as follows. Rule number one, I couldn't leave. I stopped trying to open the doors and windows after the first few days. The house tolerated it a little bit, but if I started doing it excessively, it shut all the doors in the house and then opened the cellar door. That was the house's way of telling me to chill out, or I could go spend some time with the other women who didn't follow the rules. I tried standing in front of the living room window once, waving my arms at anyone who drove by, but I quickly came to the conclusion that nobody out there could see me. I also discovered that every time I looked outside, the view looked very different. The buildings across the street would change from single-story homes to multi-story homes to apartment buildings to storefronts. The same was true of the vehicles and people who would pass by, giving me the impression that the house moved around a lot. How was that possible? I couldn't begin to guess. Rule number two, I have to keep the house clean. The house did not like a slacker. If I didn't clean up after myself or keep the rest of the house in a state of cleanliness, that cellar door would creak open. Rule number three, don't try to hurt the house. After about three months of living in the house by myself, I was starting to go a little stir-crazy. There wasn't much for me to do when I wasn't cleaning. 
At the time, my top choices were to either read one of the books on the bookshelf in the living room or stand at one of the windows and watch the people outside, trying to guess where in the world I was by their appearance. While cooking dinner on the stove one day, I got the bright idea to start a fire in the house, hoping that the damage I caused might help me create an opening by which I could escape. That was a very bad idea. I was able to start a small fire, but the house quickly intervened by removing all the oxygen in the room which extinguished the fire and left me gasping for air. Once I could breathe again, all the doors in the house slammed shut and the cellar door swung open. I refused to go at first, but the house had plenty of tricks up its sleeve to get me to comply. First, it prevented my access to the pantry and the fridge. When that didn't work, it cut off all the power, leaving me cold and hungry. The only thing I was allowed access to was water from the tap. I made it almost 48 hours before I gave in and went down into the cellar. The house kept me down there for the same amount of time that I had refused to go. When I emerged, I had learned my lesson, but the house didn't trust me to use the stove for quite a while after that, leaving me to eat cold meals. Shortly after that, I learned what it was that the house wanted from me. The morning it dawned on me, I was looking at myself in the mirror when I noticed that the bags under my eyes had gotten puffier than I remembered. I also noticed that the skin on my cheeks was starting to sag a bit. I had originally thought it was due to the weight I had gained from binge eating whatever the hell I wanted, but that wasn't it. You're starting to look like an old woman, I said to my reflection, and that's when it hit me. The comment reminded me of Charlotte, specifically how old she looked. That, in turn, reminded me of the college ID card I had found in the attic. The one I thought had belonged to her daughter. That wasn't your daughter. That was her. If I was right, it meant that Charlotte was about my age when she moved into the house, and she must have moved in the previous year since that was the year that was printed on her ID card. It's taking our youth. I was sure that's what was happening. The house was feeding off of me, siphoning years off my life to extend its own. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. There is one thing I can do, I said to myself. I can survive just like Charlotte did. Over the next eight months, I changed my habits. If the house was shortening my lifespan, the only thing I could do was try to extend it by becoming healthier. I did that by eating better foods and making sure I got plenty of exercise. That way, once I got out, I'd still have some life to look forward to, hopefully. It was hard times and I gave up more than once, but all it took to get me back on track was another trip down into the cellar to remind me that there was only one way I was getting out of that place alive. The sound of someone knocking on the front door drew me out of my thoughts. I was sitting at the breakfast table drinking a cup of coffee while watching a cardinal flit around the backyard when I heard it. At first, I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me which was something that had started happening a lot more often as my body had gotten older. The knocking sound came again, louder this time. There really is someone knocking on the front door, I thought. I pulled myself up from the table, eliciting jolts of pain from every joint in my body that I had to move. As I shuffled over to the front door, the little metal latch swung open, allowing me to see outside. What do you want? I asked. Saying those words gave me a feeling of deja vu. Hi, The bubbly young redhead on the porch gave me a wave of her hand. I'm here about your ad in the paper. Ad in the paper? I was confused for a moment as the sense of deja vu got stronger. The room for rent, she clarified, producing a folded up newspaper from her purse. Oh, I said, forcing a smile to my lips. The ad. You'll have to forgive me. The coffee hasn't kicked in yet. The door then swung open, and for the first time in a year, I could feel the outside air on my face. With it came a flood of scents that threatened to bring tears to my eyes. I stood there in the doorway and savored the sensations. Freedom was within my grasp. This is how Charlotte must have felt when I appeared on the doorstep a year ago. Are you okay? The redhead asked after seeing the spacey look on my face. I've, I've never felt better. I smiled at her. Why don't you come on inside and let me give you the tour? And I stepped back and she entered the house.